In the last few videos, we've seen that if you know the number of electron groups around a central atom, you can use Vesper theory to better understand the geometric arrangement of those electron groups. That is, its electron geometry. A more commonly used term called molecular geometry is what remains of the electron geometry after lone pairs have been excluded from the geometric arrangement. So with all this in mind, uh, let's see if we can't use our knowledge of molecular shapes to determine the shapes of a few real molecules. So the first molecule uh, that we're going to do is ammonia, NH3. So what is the shape around the nitrogen atom in ammonia? Well, unfortunately, the chemical formula alone, the molecular formula, is not enough, uh, it doesn't carry enough information uh, for us to determine its molecular shape. We need to find out uh, the number of electron groups around that nitrogen atom, and uh, certainly there are three hydrogens bonded to it, but there might be lone pairs in there, and we need to be aware of those lone pairs. So. Uh, you gotta just, in this case, you, you would have to know how to draw Lewis structures. So if you're rusty on drawing Lewis structures or if you don't know how to do it, uh, I do have a couple of videos on that. It shows you step by step how to do Lewis structures and, um, and so forth. So if we draw the Lewis structure for uh, ammonium correctly, we get this. Notice the total number of valence electrons. There's uh, eight valence electrons. Nitrogen has five, and each of the three hydrogens has one. So this is what the Lewis structure of NH3 looks like. So now that we, know the, now that we have the Lewis structure, the correct Lewis structure written down, now we're in a position to determine the number of electron groups around the nitrogen atom. So each of the bonds counts as one electron group, and then this lone pair also counts as an electron group. So there's four total electron groups around this nitrogen atom, and when there are four electron groups around a central atom, that gives rise to a tetrahedral electron geometry. Tetrahedral. The molecular geometry, as I said before, is basically just what remains of the electron geometry once you exclude the lone pairs. So if we were to exclude the lone pair in this, well, let's, let's first draw what the, uh, you know, the tetrahedral shape first and then see what's left over. I, I find that's the best way to do it, at least in my opinion. So if we draw a more accurate representation of what this shape actually looks like with a tetrahedral electron geometry, well, a tetrahedron kind of looks like this. Notice the, uh, the wedge line basically means that uh, the bond is coming towards you out of the board, and the dashed line means that the bond is going into the board away from you. So three of these things are hydrogens. Three of the ligands on this tetrahedron are hydrogens. And the remaining one is a lone pair. So three atoms, one lone pair, uh, that corresponds to a trigonal pyramidal geometry. And the approximate bond angle between two of these hydrogens is approximately 109.5 degrees. It's actually a little bit less than that, and the reason why the actual bond angle is a little bit less than the th theoretical uh, tetrahedral value of 109.5 is because lone pairs have a tendency to repel the bonding pairs more than the bonding pairs repel each other. So basically what's going on is uh, the lone pair is, is, is basically um, pushing these three atoms together a little bit more than expected. Um, you can think of it sort of like an umbrella closing. That's basically what's going on here. Okay, so that is the, uh, that's the shape of NH3. Let's move on to a different molecule. How about CO2? 
carbon dioxide. What does this look like in three-dimensional space? Well, if you do the Lewis structure for CO2 correctly, I'm not really going to go through all the details because it would make this video really long, but the Lewis structure for CO2, if you do everything correctly, looks like this. The, carb the carbon is doubly bonded to each of the two oxygens. So now that we have the Lewis structure, we can determine how many electron groups there are. And each of the double bonds, although they are double bonds, but each of them counts as one electron group. So there are two electron groups around that central carbon. This corresponds to a linear electron geometry. Since there are no lone pairs on this carbon, the molecular geometry is identical to the electron geometry, which is also linear. Uh, let's do another one. How about H2O? Water. So if you draw the Lewis structure for water correctly, then you'll get something that looks like this. Notice the total number of valence electrons in the Lewis structure is the total number of valence electrons in these atoms, period. Uh, oxygen has six and hydrogen has two, uh, one, and there are two of them, so that's eight total valence electrons. And here we have two, four, six, eight valence electrons. So this is a legitimate Lewis structure for water. Uh, how many electron groups are around that central oxygen, though, is the real question here. So. Each of the lone pairs counts as one, each of the bonding pairs counts as one, so it looks like we have four electron groups, which gives rise to a tetrahedral electron geometry, as we've seen in the case of ammonium, or ammonia. We have a tetrahedral electron geometry. However, two of those groups are lone pairs, so that's going to give rise to a different uh, molecular geometry. So. Again, what I like to do is I like to just draw it out as if it's just a, a, a tetrahedron and then I like to take bonds away and put on lone pairs to see what the molecular geometry looks like. So if we have our central oxygen and we have a tetrahedron around it, two of those groups are going to be hydrogens. And the other two are going to be lone pairs. So notice that H2O and CO2 have entirely different shapes because in CO2 there's no lone pairs on the central atom, but in H2O we have two lone pairs on the central atom. So this gives rise to a bent molecular geometry. And the approximate bond angle between these two hydrogens is 109, excuse me, 109.5 degrees. But the actual bond angle is uh, about 105 degrees, so it's a little less than 109.5 degrees. Again, it's because the lone pairs have a tendency to push the bonding pairs together because they have more uh, repelling power, basically. All right, so there's water. Uh, let's do a different one. How about BH3? Again, uh, we have to uh, determine the Lewis structure of this guy before we can, you know, determine how how many electron groups there are. So we have our boron, and we have three hydrogens attached to it. Boron doesn't have any lone pairs on it because uh, boron's actually one of those uh, interesting elements that tends to form incomplete octets. So this is the you know most commonly accepted Lewis structure for BH3, even though the boron atom does not have an octet. So we have three electron groups, 
electron geometry, that's going to be trigonal planar. And none of those electron groups are lone pairs, so that means that the molecular geometry is also going to be trigonal planar. The bond angle between these two hydrogens is 120 degrees, just as expected. All right, uh, let's do another one. Maybe one that's a little bit more challenging. How about SF4? Sulfur tetrafluoride. Well, once again, we got to draw the Lewis structure. So if we draw the Lewis structure correctly, we'll have our uh, less electronegative sulfur atom in the middle. And we will have four fluorine atoms hooked to it. And fluorine has seven valence electrons, so each of these fluorines is going to have three lone pairs on it also. But notice that the total number of valence electrons isn't used up. Uh, we have fluorine has seven uh, valence electrons, and there are four of them, so that's 28. And then sulfur has six valence electrons. So 28 plus 6, that is 34 total valence electrons. And if you count up all these electrons, I'm not going to do it right now, but if you count all these up, then you'll actually get 32. So there's two missing valence electrons, and those are going to have to go on the sulfur atom. There's nowhere else that they can go. So we have five total electron groups. We have four bonds and a lone pair. So if we have five electron groups, that's going to give rise to a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. So to figure out the molecular, uh, the molecular geometry of this thing, let's go ahead and draw SF4 as a trigonal bipyramid and then we'll figure out where that lone pair goes. So a trigonal bipyramid, that's going to look something like this. You have our sulfur in the middle, and then you have two of these axial positions, and then three of these equatorial positions. So four of these things are going to be fluorine atoms, and one of them is going to be a lone pair. And for reasons that I've gone over in, uh, I think, the last video, maybe either the last video or the video before it, the lone pair actually occupies an equatorial position and not the axial position. So these four are going to be fluorine atoms. And there are lone pairs on the fluorines, although I'm not going to draw them in right now because that's not really important uh, for the purposes of the shape around this sulfur. So we have five electron groups, one lone pair. That lone pair goes equatorial and that gives us a seesaw molecular geometry. All right, so I think I'll uh, end the video for now. Um, I might do another video with a few more molecules just to get some more practice in, but uh, it, it, the basic idea of the whole thing is pretty straightforward. Uh, you got to be able, you know, pretty comfortable, you know, drawing Lewis structures, and then from there, it, it's pretty much a matter of just counting electron groups and just, um, you know, understanding some of the finer points of Vesper theory. So, all right, I hope this uh, video has helped, and uh, good luck doing molecular shapes.